Good morning, everyone. I'm Marie Potowski Beals, and I'm the business analyst at the Small Business Development Center at Yavapai College. And we are going to start and introduce uh, Chris Winder today. And Chris is a uh, IT professional, and he is also a author and a writer, and he has published 30 novels. So today, um, Chris, um, let me just start off telling people a little bit about the SBDC services. And we help small businesses launch, grow, and sustain and exit their enterprises. We also help with technical assistance, um, like disaster loan assistance, lender readiness. And we have all different kinds of resources available to our clients that we can share. Uh, like Growth Wheel and Profit Sense and Ibis World, we have subscriptions to those. And you can uh, request a confidential counseling center session with one of our counselors when you sign up at yc.edu slash SBDC. So um, I just want to um, let Chris know that we are um, here and available if anybody needs any help. And um, Chris, I think I'm going to pass it over to you now. And, um, and then I'll go over a couple more things about the SBDC. All right, thank you. So let's go. Oh my gosh, I should have practiced this in advance. Okay, let's do, I want to share my camera. How do I share my camera, Dagnabbit? All right, this will work. All right, so today's objective is to learn about security specifically. It's gonna be practical, low cost, free and small business focused. You, you might hear a lot of a lot of other IT guys talking about security, but they want, you know, thousands of dollars a month. And those options are available, but generally aren't practical for small businesses, because if you're going to do that, you might as well just hire a security person full time. So our objectives are to learn the risks, the security risks that all small businesses have. To learn how to mitigate those risks, establish a starting point. If you can't fix it right now, what can you do in the meantime and prepare you to form a plan for the future? Because as you expand, as your what's called your attack surface grows, uh, the risks are going to be a lot higher. Our focus points are going to be four of them. Operational security. These are things that happen every single day, things that you do every single day besides your job. So if you're an auto repair shop, it, we're not talking about auto repair talking about everything else that goes with it. Then physical security, which is not necessarily locking your doors, although that's very, very handy. Since I'm an IT person, I'm going to be talking about IT. Uh, computer security, which is talking about individual computers on your network, and then the network as a whole. So the first topic, operational security. I want you to think about what's the biggest risk to your business. It's not your computers. It's not your network. It's not fire. Not these days. If you say that any of those are wrong, instead, it's your employees. And if you're a solopreneur like me, it's you. You're, you are your biggest risk. Because it's not like, like you see in the movies anymore where a hacker sits down, he, he turns his ball cap backwards and he types away at his computer and he gets in through the internet and, and hacks your system. That still happens, but it's much more difficult these days. Instead, what we have mostly is called social engineering. This is where people are tricked into allowing the hacker in. It's like someone comes in, knocks on your door, Sure, they could kick the door open, but that's a lot harder than tricking you into letting them in, pretending to be somebody that, that they're not. Uh, for instance, 
um, I won't say where I work, but I'll say that I, I travel to a lot of other businesses and rarely did I get asked any questions if I was carrying a clipboard. That's it. I can into your computer sitting on the other side of the world. It does happen, but it takes a lot of resources and usually a lot of people. This is the kind of thing that countries do to other countries. You're not going to have some some kid in, in North Korea sitting down at his computer by himself hacking into your computer. That's just not going to happen anymore. Instead, they're going to get your employees to do something. The number one flaw with your employees is weak passwords. I know everybody hates when passwords have to update and you have to think up a brand new one and it has to have 18 characters and uppercase characters and lowercase characters and symbols and you have to stand on one foot. But I'm gonna show you how well it actually works when you do that. So the, I got this information from commando.com. I've heard it elsewhere. I trust the source, but this is going to be a table that's going to show you different kinds of passwords that you could use, different strengths, including numbers and special characters, uppercase and lowercase, and how long it would take the average computer that, like the computer I'm on right now, the computer you have at your work, how long it would take that computer to crack that password. So if you look here, if it's only four characters, and numbers only, it's going to be instantaneous. So if you think using a four digit pin as your online password, which I'm not sure anybody allows that anymore, but if you think that's going to work, it's not. All the way across the board, if it's only four characters, it's instantaneous. But if we move to lowercase letters and make it 10 digits long, so numbers and lowercase letters, it'll take about an hour. That's still not secure because Anybody with any any sense can just walk away from the computer, go make a sandwich, come back, and poof, they have your password. But if you if it's only ten characters, numbers, uppercase, lowercase, letters, and symbols, that's five years. Chances are you're going to change your password before then, anyways. So even if it's only ten characters long, but you do all that, five years, the information is probably old that they were trying to get, anyways. But look at this. This is why a lot, like I've got one client who has to update their password and it has to be 18 characters. This is one of their vendors. It's not even me, but they want uppercase, lowercase, numbers and symbols. They, they're going for the big one. That's 17 quadrillion years. We're probably going to be computers if we're still around by then. So this table shows that just using numbers, I mean, even 18 characters, numbers only is nine months. I'm not sure anyone, anyone listening actually has any information that important that someone's going to devote a computer to it for nine months. But why take, take the risk? Because just adding lowercase letters takes it to 23 million years it would take to crack that password. Man, the computer's going to wear out by then, guaranteed. So take a good look at this table, take a screenshot from the recording, show it to your employees, and show them why you need to have them, have them use a long password. A long password with uppercase, lowercase symbols, and the whole works. So the mitigation is to purchase cybersecurity insurance. Most people haven't even heard of this, but in case of a data breach, if you lose some information, especially personally identifiable information, especially from the medical field, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars per incident. If you have, let's say, 500 uh, clients and you lose data on each of them, you're talking millions. And if you don't have this insurance, you're not going to recover anything. Basically, you're going to be shut down. Another mitigation is to enforce a strong password, like I said. Another one is don't use a password anywhere more than once. Now, it's going to be basically impossible to force your employees to do this but encourage it because if you, you go out of business, they lose their job. Remind them of that. And like with me, I'm, I'm the type of IT work I do is, is called a managed service provider. So I have lots of clients. I have to keep track of lots of passwords. No two passwords are the same. They're all long and complicated. There's no way I can memorize them. Instead, 
I use this service, onepassword.com. There are others out there, and this is not an affiliate of mine. I'm not gonna make any money off of this. It's just for you. But they have plans anywhere from $2.99 a month to $14.99 per month. And I have hundreds of passwords that I keep track of. And it's encrypted because if I get hacked and my passwords get loose, everybody gets hacked. Because it's I, I keep everyone's passwords for everything. So this is why I use this service. This is a service I trust. Another form of attack they do with social engineering is called phishing. Most of the time, these are emails. And hopefully everyone's heard of the, what's kind of nicknamed the Nigerian prints emails. These are the ones that, that promise you something, but they need something in return. And they're completely unexpected. Um, I went through, I've, I've got an email address that I've had for about 20 years that I pretty much ignore, but I don't want to get rid of because it's kind of fun to go in once in a while, but I get at least a thousand spam emails a day. So I just picked a few of them out here. Oh, yeah, right. What, what phishing is, it's a practice of tricking internet users into revealing personal or confidential information, which can be used illicitly. It doesn't mean it's an instant hack, it's just feed me information so I can do bad stuff later. Here's one. So last call, Chris Winder, attention, military vets and families act now, blah, blah, blah. This is old Camp Lejeune thing, I guess. Uh, uh, there was some bad water at Camp Lejeune and the government didn't tell anybody, um, but I've got hundreds of these emails. And the websites they take you to may or may not be legitimate, but here's some clues we can take as to whether or not an email is legitimate. First of all, I didn't ask for this. Second, I don't know the person who sent it. Third, what kind of professional email? If this was, let's say, a, a law office, you ever seen a law office do Christmas colors? No, they do this to try to disguise their email and get past the filters at yahoo.com, which is where this came in. So if you see weird stuff like this, it looks completely unprofessional. That should be your first clue. Here's a worse one. And this is actually the, the Nigerian prince kind of things, but this one happens to list Dubai. So let's go through some of the details as to what makes this one suspicious. First, attention beneficiary. I'm sure some of you have scanned ahead and you've seen $2.5 million. If they're gonna send me $2.5 million, shouldn't they know who I am? Shouldn't they know in advance? So if they don't list my name, obviously there's something wrong. And this is officially inform you. I think they meant this is to officially inform you, but improper English and proper grammar, that's another clue. Uh, suppose to be made payable to you from United Nations, the UN United Nations is supposed to be capitalized. Okay, here's a weird space here. Looks like they did a double space. They were typing too fast or something. Again, a profes professional office shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. Uh, delivered to you through a security company. Why'd they capitalize the A? Uh, a security company between uh, UAE and there's another capital. And if they're gonna send me $2.5 million, why are they asking for all this information? Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, Nobody's going to fall for this. If that were true, they wouldn't be sending these emails. People are falling for it. If it's only one in a million, it's worth it to them because it doesn't cost them anything to send these emails out. These are the kinds of things your employees sh should be aware of. They should be looking for. And the cheapest, easiest way to do it is when you get one of these, print it out. Print it out and maybe maybe have a... a, a a cork board that you stick them up at and laugh at them, make it a game for your employees, but get them aware that this is going to happen. It's just a matter of time. I've had this, this account, I said for a long time. So I get these all the time, but everyone's going to get them eventually. And the very last one that we're talking about $2.5 million. This is not going to come from a Gmail address. Not, not if they're a professional. So if you see 
at gmail.com or at anything that doesn't take you to a real website owned by a real company, it's time to be suspicious. But this is something that you constantly have to train your employees on. Remind them, show them over and over again that this, this is the kind of stuff that they can expect. And if they're not sure, to ask. And if you're not there, either ignore the email and ask later or just outright delete it. Another risk is attachments. So this is supposed to be uh, your order confirmation, blah, blah, blah. I didn't order anything. But when was the last time you ordered anything from any company and they sent you a receipt as a JPEG file, .jpg? JPEGs are pictures. They're not PDF files. They're not documents. They're not Word documents, but a JPG. Never, ever, ever click on anything in an, that's attached to an email that you did not expect. And if you're not sure, and you know the person, call them and ask, did you, did you send me something? Some people might think it's being a little, a little paranoid, but is your business worth a little bit of paranoia? That's what you got to ask. It pays to be paranoid, especially since basically half the world is out to get us. Again, this one came from gmail.com. Uh, if Amazon sent it, it would come from amazon.com or whatever delivery company. So again, how you, how you mitigate this is you train your employees to be suspicious of absolutely everything. For instance, uh, let's say your, your, finance, your finance person is not going to write a check to just anyone who hands them a bill. They're going to check and find out what was this bill for, uh, should it be paid, what account should it be paid from, what expense should it, be, should, should it uh, fall under, and who the heck are you if I've never met you before and you're handing me a bill. People have been tricked just by, just by getting bills. Someone sends them a bill, finance sends them a check without even questioning it. Those people have gotten in a lot of trouble and cost their companies a lot of money. Do the same thing with the emails. If you use Google Chrome as your web browser, it allows you to record, record your password with Google, and it can tell you if there's been a security breach. I do this on my, on my basic websites I go to, not anything super important, just my basic websites like Facebook. Um, I let Google record my password. Number one, it's easier to log in. And number two, if there's a breach, Google will tell me right away. Another thing you can do is hire a professional to train your employees on an ongoing basis. This is kind of self-serving, but this is something I do. There's, there's lots of us out there that do this. We can set up an automated system that will send very convincing emails to your employees. And then if they click the link or if they click on the attachment, it will let you know, it will scold them, and then they can sign up for training or, or you can sign up for training, or it'll at least be a nice little way to to tease them, to try to get them to remember. But what if you maybe have go, went ahead and clicked on something, entered something, you thought it was from your bank and it turns out maybe it wasn't. How do you know if it's too late, if it's time to change your passwords? Well, there's a website for that too. And this one is also free. Have I been pwned.com? That's not a misspelling. Uh, this is a, this is a gamer word. So you, you know about getting owned, like someone owns you. That means that they won and you lost big time. Well, I guess substituting the letter P for the letter O makes it even worse. So have I been pwned.com? If you go there, you can put in your email address to see if it's been part of a data breach. And putting in my email address, good news, no pwnage found. That means this email address, as of this very second, has not been part of any kind of data breach. This is something Google will tell you about, but if you're using any other browser, or if you just want to double check, have I been pwned.com is a great resource. Let me go back to that. So if you want to write this down, I'll give you just a second here. And again, this is what it looks like if everything's fine. Good news, no opponents found. That old email address, 
but I hang around, I, I keep around just for fun. Here's this address. Oh no, pwned. This email address has been in nine data breaches and one paste. A paste is when someone takes the info that's been released, copies it, and then sticks it on a message board or into a forum somewhere. This website found nine data breaches. It would not hurt to check once in a while, check on all your, all your official email addresses, all your personal ones to see if you've been part of a data breach. If you have, it's time to go in and change every single password you've got. Because unless you can dig up what data breach that was and what kind of information was released, you really wouldn't know. And it, it's completely worth it to go in and change all those passwords. Okay, so uh, with mitigation, although there are many other ways to mitigate the risks, they are more complicated than the steps I've listed so far, and these require an in-person consultation to better understand your business and budget. But everything I've listed so far is either very low cost or free. If you want anything beyond that, that would take an appointment. Next is everyone's favorite, viruses and malware. Okay, computer viruses are merely, pro merely programs designed to do bad things to your computer and hide their activities. A virus isn't going to make itself known, at least until it's done doing whatever it's going to do. Like you've heard of ransomware. I've seen lots of ransomware. It's been a while, probably, probably a year, year and a half since I've seen any. But ransomware makes, only makes itself known after it's done, after it's done doing all the bad things it's going to do. Malware, on the other hand, are virus-like programs that don't hide themselves. Usually they disguise themselves as a free antivirus. And the programmers who develop these are really good at graphic design. They look beautiful. They look professional. They go, they go out to all these other programs and see what these other programs look like, and they make it look the same way. But they either don't do their job they do it poorly, or they're so badly written, bad things happen to your computer. Or the fourth option, while you think you're getting virus protection, they're actually installing viruses. I've seen that happen as well. Badware, on the other hand, can be malware, but that's usually just very poorly designed. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do, or it crashes your computer. So hey, mitigate against viruses and malware. Purchase and use a quality antivirus, and no Microsoft Defender doesn't count. I know Windows comes with an antivirus, but it's not a really good antivirus. I wouldn't trust it. If it worked, you wouldn't have all all these uh, uh, data breaches. You wouldn't you wouldn't have hospitals being shut down due to ransomware, and and all these other antivirus companies will go out of business. It's not a good antivirus. Find one that you purchase that has a good reputation. And if you need advice, call me, email me, free advice all day long, no problem. But don't use, don't rely on Microsoft Defender. Uh, another, another thing you can do is ensure that none of your employees are administrators on any of your computers. How you know right away if someone's an administrator is if they can install software. So if they double click in a program and it lets them install, they're an administrator. Viruses have to be installed one way or another. And it's much more difficult to install a program if you're not an administrator. If you're not sure, I can check for you that that'd be part of the evaluation. It wouldn't cost anything. Uh, third thing you can do is don't use an administrator account for daily tasks unless you have no choice. So if you're a solopreneur, especially have two accounts on your computer, one as an administrator, one as a regular user, only use the administrator account when you need to install something. That's all you really need it for anyways. And if you double click in a program and it says, oh, please, uh, please enter your administrator username and password. That works too. You don't actually have to be logged into the administrator account. And if all else fails, use backup software so you can recover your computer. Most backup software nowadays allows you to take a thumb drive, 
like this and put a small program on it as as part of your your backup software so that if your computer gets infected and let's say a, a ransomware takes over you can plug this in reboot your computer boot it off of this device and recover everything you basically you roll back the clock to the last time it was backed up and it's like it never happened and if that does happen and you have to roll back it's time to switch antivirus because the last one didn't protect you oh and these these can be cheap too this can be anywhere from thirty dollars you know thirty dollars on up per year per computer which is really cheap if you need to recover Next thing we got to worry about with your employees is theft. Employee theft happens. If you're a solopreneur, you really can't steal from yourself, obviously. But the more employees you have, the more likely it is to happen. This is why you should have employee theft insurance as well. So the type, two types of theft is going to be hardware and information. Yeah, there's, there's other things they could steal. They could steal your product, but we're just focusing on IT right now. So under hardware, uh, computers, copiers, and scanners, yes, they can steal them, but that means they have to kick in a door, break a window, or somehow get you not to notice that they're carrying a giant computer out. However, information is a lot easier to steal, such as company secrets, client lists, and personally identifiable, identifiable information. That last one is the worst. That is the one that even if an employee steals it, you can be held liable for it. So what do you do to mitigate? Purchase employee theft insurance. Hopefully you have that. Lock your doors and windows to prevent physical theft or from people coming in when they're not supposed to. Lock your computers to your desks using something called a Kensington lock. Basically it's a cable that connects your desk to your computer. And while it won't completely prevent anyone from stealing, it means they have to yank on it or they have to actually cut the cable to steal your computer. I mean, no lock is perfect. If someone wants to get into your house, they're going to get in. But locks make it a lot more difficult and it gives them a chance to have a second thought like, hmm, should I really be doing this? Uh, purchase an alarm system, which alarm systems probably will stop them. But worst case scenario, have security cameras so you can at least bust the person who did it. Now, of course, alarm systems and security cameras, especially security cameras, those can be pricey. Protecting information is a lot more difficult, but it's also a lot more expensive to recover from, especially personal, uh, personally identifiable information. Of course, if you're working in the medical field, everyone has to sign those HIPAA forms. Hopefully you did that. That might alleviate some of your liability. But you can also have USB locks. Most of the information is not going to be printed, folded up, and put in a pocket. It's going to be someone taking a little USB device, plugging it into the computer, and stealing the information that way so they can go through it later and they can preserve it. There are ways to lock down your USB ports. There's software. You can do it in the BIOS. You can also get uh, physical... USB locks that plug into the USB and have to be removed with a special key. Those can be a little bit expensive and it's not always practical because you still got to plug in your mouse and keyboard. So if they're clever, they can just unplug the keyboard, plug a USB drive in wherever the keyboard was plugged in and steal the information that way. So this is it's quite a bit more difficult. This is why insurance is going to be is going to be definitely helpful. Hopefully you never have to use it, but if you do, you'd be glad you have it. The very best way to secure information is to take your computer, lock it in a vault, pour concrete over the vault, and then throw the vault in the ocean, in the deepest part you can find. That, that would be the very best way to secure information. But that's not practical. Instead, we have to find a balance. So a balance between usability and security. So locking USB ports would make it far more secure, but what if you do actually need to use a thumb drive to either install a program 
or move some information or back up some information, something like that. Uh, these are considerations you're going to have to take with your own business. Now we're moving on to physical security. The number one flaw I've seen with physical security is network jacks. Now, most people think that network jacks are, are just a place to plug into your computer. But what they don't understand is that this is, is, this is a prime opportunity for a hacker, especially like an ex-employee or just an opportunist, to get easily into your network, to bypass all of your security and start doing bad things. So this is a, a diagram of a typical network. Hopefully you have all these components. First component is the internet. It's always expressed with the cloud like on like on here. Um, this is where the bad guys live. This is where everybody tries to protect themselves from and you should. Uh, a recent FBI study says that no computer can be on the internet for more than five minutes before it's attacked. I wasn't sure about that, so I had a computer, I set it in something called a DMZ, demilitarized zone, and I stuck it out there and I waited, and it took about five minutes before I was getting about 30,000 attacks per second, people trying to crack into it. And that was alarming. From the internet comes a router. This is usually supplied in our area by Sparklight. Okay, Sparklight also has a firewall built into it. So going back, the router just connects your network to the internet, which is another network, a much larger network. The, the firewall is where all the security happens. This is where, this is the device that hackers have to get through, that viruses have to get through, that everything has to get through. And generally, overall, when you get a modem from Sparklight, the firewall is set up sufficiently enough to protect your business. But if you buy your own modem, like you go to Best Buy and, and buy your own modem, it may or may not have a firewall at all. For instance, the one I bought, the uh, SB6183, it's a surfboard, did not come with a firewall which was no problem. It was cheap, it was fast, and I have another firewall uh, protecting my network, so it's no problem. But if you bought a modem, you got a modem from somewhere else besides Sparklight, you may not be protected. And if you're not protected, everything on the internet is eventually going to get in. But when we're, when we're talking about network jacks, network jacks plug into your switch. If you have more than one computer, you have a switch, especially if you have your own commercial location and there's network jacks all over the place. If a hacker can connect directly to your switch, bypass the firewall, they're in. And there's very little security once they're in your switch. Recently had a customer ask me to make sure that every single network jack was plugged in to a switch just in case. And I said, just in case what? Uh, just in case we need to move a computer. I said, well, if you need to move a computer, you're going to call me and I'll move the computer, right? Oh, right, right. Then I'm not going to plug it in. Well, why not? So I explained this and I could see the gears moving. I saw the light come on and son of a gun, he decided not to have me plug all the network jacks in. Because if a network jack is not plugged into your switch, it's a dead jack. It doesn't go anywhere. You can always plug it in later. But as a small business owner, you should only plug in the network, really anybody, you should only plug in the network jacks that you're currently using. If a computer goes away, uh, say uh, uh, the computer dies, you're not gonna replace it for a while because the person left anyways, or the person left so the computer's going back into storage, disable that network jack. And if you don't know how to do it, hopefully you have an IT person who does, or you're gonna have to get an IT person. But an even bigger threat is this little device. And yes, that's to scale. I've got two of these. This is a Raspberry Pi. 
I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this before, but this is a palm sized single board computer. It will do everything. You can surf the internet, you can watch movies, you can plug in your mouse, and you can connect it to a network. Now, how likely do you think it would be? Oh, and you can get battery packs for these as well. You don't actually have to plug it into the wall. But how likely do you think it would be for someone to, let's say, walk up to a network jack, plug this thing in, and Velcro it to the bottom of a chair in your waiting room? I've played this scenario out in my head a thousand times. Um, I, I think this would be fun for a company who wants to do something called penetration testing, where they actually try to hack into your network because you paid them to, and then they show you how they got in and what you can do to, uh, to prevent that next time. But this little device is a very powerful quad core computer. It's, it's equivalent to, let's say, uh, a five-year-old desktop, something you bought at Best Buy five years ago, which is plenty to get on to get onto your network and do bad things these can be automated as well so as soon as it detects that it's on a network it starts one type of attack if that doesn't work it starts another and it goes on and on until it finally opens a back door and now it can get in through the internet this is the kind of thing you have to watch out for this is why network jacks should be disabled when they're not being used You may think, uh, oh, I don't have any exposed network jacks, but do you have security cameras? If it's not closed circuit TV with coax cable, instead you have a network jack like this that it plugs into, that can easily be unplugged and something else plugged in, or something else plugged in and disguised as one of these. You think, oh, oh, APS must have come by. Mm -mm. No, the hacker has one of these inside one of these because you have this exposed outside now how do you mitigate this this connector right here needs to be in a locked box and it needs to be visible you can get lots of lots of lock boxes from home depot ace hardware all over the place just a little box so that you can secure this connection and so hopefully you can notice if it's been broken into but this is something i've seen a few times uh, it's not very common, but it would be super easy to tap into this because this plugs directly into a switch, which plugs directly into your network. And if one of these boxes shows up outside, no matter what it says on the outside, because, because I mean, you, you can go to the swap meet and go pick up a spark light box that somebody pulled off a, a house that got torn down or just stole. Um, and if you see a new box on the side of your building, I would definitely investigate it. In fact, probably just go ahead and, and investigate every box on the outside of your building right now. Well, after the, after the presentation, of course. If it has a lock on it, it's probably legitimate. If it's spark light and it's the only one and you actually have spark light service, it's probably legitimate. But if it has nothing on the outside, I would be very suspicious of it. Okay, yeah, I already covered the mitigation. Uh, disconnect any unused network jacks. If you have any external network jacks that's outside of your building, make sure that they're in a steel enclosure that you can lock. And if you have a network jack that guests use to plug in, consider placing that jack onto something called a VLAN to isolate it from the rest of the network. A VLAN is basically a completely separate network so that anything plugged in there can't see the rest of your computers. It's, it's logically kind of like physically separated from the rest of your network. It might as well be in another country. So if you have an IT guy and you have a network jack that other people use, ask the IT guy if your equipment can do this and set it on something called a VLAN. It's a virtual local area network. All right, moving right along. Hopefully you all write fast. But moving on to computer security, this is individual computers. We've already discussed ensuring that you have and use a quality antivirus. Use Kensington locks to help prevent computers from being stolen, backup computers in case where it should happen, and disabling access to USB ports. But we haven't discussed BitLocker, on-site backups, 
physical software keys, and loose passwords. So BitLocker, I think everyone's using Windows 10 or Windows 11 right now. Uh, BitLocker is a way to lock your hard drive so that if your computer is stolen, it's still inaccessible. Or someone cracks open your computer, steals the hard drive, they can't do anything with it. Uh, Mac users have something called File Vault, which more or less does the same thing. But for Windows users, you have to have Windows 10 or 11 Pro. So Windows 10 Pro or Windows 11 Pro, those are the only versions that have BitLocker available. Now there's pros and cons with BitLocker. So you might want to think about these before you just go ahead and jump in with both feet. Pros. With any computer, uh, the average user or business would likely to own uh, cracking the encryption BitLocker provides would take about 13 billion years. If you call me because your computer is locked with BitLocker, you can't log in, you don't have your recovery key, um, I'm going to say that's really sad because there's nothing I can do. I've tried, I've, I've done everything I possibly could, and I've, I've given up. BitLocker is uncrackable. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you lose your Windows passwords, you can use your BitLocker recovery key to decrypt your hard drive. If you set BitLocker, you're actually going to get a, uh, a recovery key that that uh, the computer's going to tell you to write down and stick in a vault somewhere. Please do it, because if you don't, all that data is gone. We're going to start from scratch. But another pro is all your data, including Windows itself, is locked away. Even if someone physically seals your computer, you can have basically whatever info you want on there, personally identifiable information, passwords, your bank account, number, anything. And if they can't log into the computer, they cannot get it. BitLocker is cool because it, first thing it does is it, it encrypts your entire hard drive. Then as you're using your computer, it only decrypts what it needs. So if it needs to, if you need to log in, it decrypts that portion of the software to let you log in. Then once you're log in, logged in, it only decrypts files that you're accessing. So even if you lose power right in the middle of it, only those files you are accessing are decrypted. But the cons, if you lose both your password and your BitLocker recovery key, you start from scratch. If Windows suffers a catastrophic error and you don't have backups of your files, they're gone forever. I've had that happen as well. And it's sad, but there's literally nothing I can do except pat you on the shoulder and tell you everything's going to be okay, even if it's not. And if your computer dies to a hardware failure, you start from scratch. Because you can't just pull the hard drive out of that computer and stick it in another one and expect it to work, because it won't. BitLocker is tied to that computer, that very specific computer. So, on the pros, it locks everything down. On the cons, it also locks everything down. So everything's a risk. Only you can decide if BitLocker is something you want to use based on your situation. Most of the time, I don't use it, but there are, are, there are a couple customers who do use it because they only have a couple computers and they have backups of everything. Let's talk about an on-site backup. This is not a cloud backup that, that backup, backs up everything to the internet. Instead, it backs it up, let's say, to a thumb drive, a hard drive, or something called a NAS, Network Accessible Storage. So the pros of backing up on site is that backup and recovery are a lot faster. I think the fastest speed we can get with Sparklight, unless you live in a, a, a special area of, of, of the Quad Cities that I don't, it's going to be about 300 megs down, 30 megs up. But on your network, you should have 1,000 megs down and 1,000 megs up. So that transfer of information happens much faster within your network. But the cons, backup solutions such as external hard drives and thumb drives can easily fit into a pocket or backpack. Or if you have a fire, it burns up your computer and burns up your backup, everything's gone. If it's backed up to the cloud, you can still recover your information. So it's speed versus accessibility. And yes, so there are options to back up not only to the cloud, but local as well. So you can use whichever recovery uh, situation is available to you. 
So I had to mitigate on-site backups. Um, unplug your on-site backup every night and lock it in a safe or take it with you. I have one customer who does this. This customer's um, probably a little bit par paranoid, but eh, what, what is paranoia except like being aware of the risks? You could also uh, use a solution such as a NAS device, making sure it's located behind a locked door and is powered by a surge protector, not a power tap. We'll get into that more on that later. But if you use a NAS, never leave it where it can be easily seen or stolen. Make sure it's locked in a, in a closet, locked, locked in a, uh, a cabinet, locked somewhere so that the casual user doesn't see it. Just like you wouldn't, if you had a bar of gold, you wouldn't leave it laying around. Consider this a bar of gold, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Okay, now, power tap versus surge protector. Although this isn't directly connected to computer security, this is a, a major topic that I think a lot of people need to need to know about. And it kind of is related because if your computer is fried and that's where all your software is and and all your all your backups and all your customer files, well, then your information is lost and therefore wasn't secure. So surge protectors are devices designed to protect your equipment connected to it from power surges, which are big spikes in power sent to your device far beyond what it was designed to handle. This can be due to, due to a lightning strike. Someone could hit a telephone pole, cross a couple of wires, and all of a sudden, instead of getting 115 volts, you're getting 200 volts. Whereas power taps merely take one outlet and turn it into a whole bunch of outlets. Power taps offer zero protection. Basically, if you get a power surge, everything connected to that power tap is at risk. Whereas everything connected to a surge protector is far less at risk. They're not perfect, but they're really, really good, especially these days, as opposed to 10 years ago. Chris, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, I understand from um, maybe some advertising that surge protectors um, can wear out or that you're supposed to replace them like every five years. Do you know anything about that? that that's kind of old information when a surge protector wears out it just stops working now okay so it's not something that you're supposed to replace every five years no no i replace surge protectors when they die well when they die or when i pick them up and i hear stuff moving around inside <laughs> okay thank you for that information yeah. i just wanted to clarify so how you tell the difference between a surge protector and a power tap, it's actually really easy. Look at the back, all this printed material. If you see the word surge, it's a surge protector. If you do not see the word surge, it's a power tap. Even if it is a surge protector and they didn't think to put the word surge or surge protector on it, I wouldn't trust it. Now I've seen on Amazon surge protectors. In fact, I just bought one for, for a customer. Uh, it was less than $6. So there's really no excuse. If you want something cheap, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Ace, you can go to pretty much any of these, these kinds of stores to get a surge protector less than $10. Or if you want a really fancy one, you can spend a little bit more, but this is really inexpensive protection for your computers. Every computer, every basically anything you would plug into a wall should be on a surge protector if you care at all about it. Oh, two-factor authentication. This is fairly new and it's just coming into use. Except most people aren't using it. Recently, a friend of mine had her Facebook account hacked. Now, it wasn't really hacked. She had a bad password on it, a very short password, she admitted. And a hacker guessed it. Then the hacker duplicated her account, invited all, all their friends and use some social engineering to get their passwords as well. So two-factor authentication, first of all, what it's not. Two-factor authentication is not passwords. It's not fingerprints. It's not security keys, and it's not time locks. Because 
any of those are one factor authentication. Now, fingerprints, of course, if you have a fingerprint reader, those are pretty hard to fake. It's not like in the movies where they just breathe on it and, and poof, it works. But these are all examples of something you know, such as your password, something you are, such as your fingerprint, and something you have, such as a security key or a time lock. Two-factor authentication needs two of these. So if you go to a government installation, first of all, there's going to be guards pretty much everywhere, but they're not going to secure their best stuff with passwords. Instead, they're going to use two-factor authentication, probably fingerprints. You're going to have to use a password and a fingerprint to get in whatever door you're trying to get in. Maybe a security key, but security keys can be stolen. But even if they are, they'd have to steal your security key and your password. See how that works? And banks. I don't know if it's still it's still that way, but in the movies, they have time locks where you, they can't open the vault until business hours or just before. And then it automatically locks after business hours. It doesn't matter if you have all of these, if the time lock is still locked. So two-factor authentication is any two, so long as those two things aren't in the same category. Having two passwords is not two-factor authentication. Having a fingerprint in your right hand and your left hand isn't either. Having two security keys is not two-factor authentication. The most common two-factor authentication are passwords combined with time locks. For instance, there's something called Google Authenticator. There's also Microsoft Authenticator. What these two things do is give you a six-digit code that changes every 30 seconds. So when you put in your password, the next screen pops up and it says, what is your authenticator code? You have to download one of these two apps on your phone. You have to connect it to your account and you put in your password. And if you don't get it in time, for instance, if I'm logging into to one of my websites that I have secured and I only have five seconds left, I don't bother. I wait the five seconds. So I have 30 seconds to put in the next, the next uh, six digit code. Google Authenticator and Microsoft Authenticator are free. 100% free. Facebook has its own authenticator, or it used to. You can also get hardware authenticators, which are little key fobs that you push a button and it shows you a six digit code. Um, I can't tell you how to set these up because they're different for every single website you might want to go to. But usually if you go into the website, you go into settings, you click on security, it says set up two factor authentication. It's worth it. Because had my friend set up two-factor authentication on Facebook, which does offer it, it wouldn't matter what password she had. It could be ABC123 because they can put in the password, but if they don't have her phone, if they haven't swiped her phone as well, they can't use Google Authenticator. They can't use Microsoft Authenticator because it's tied to that phone. They can't get in. Problem solved. So two-factor authentication, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, I'm using Microsoft Authenticator, but I, they both work exactly the same. Now, physical software keys, these are far less common than they used to be. They were most common in the in industrial businesses. So um, I think the last time I saw one in an industrial business was a client who's who's gone out of business unfortunately but they had um, cnc machines and the cnc machines have to be licensed and so they had a thumb drive they had to stick in into the cnc machine to use it uh, they still exist for computer-aided drafting software embroidery software i did see one as well and others rather than relying on a machine to be networked manufacturers would provide software licenses in the form of a thumb drive which had to be inserted in the machine or the computer for the software to function. Um, these aren't so common anymore, but unfortunately what happened with one of them was they lost the key. The software was $30,000. They couldn't just say, hey, I lost my key. Can you send me another one? Because maybe they went and found another machine and they didn't want to pay for another software license. So the company said no, but we're, we're more than happy to sell you another key. So this little thumb drive right here is enough 
is enough to cost thirty thousand dollars. If you're still using these, you risk theft, loss, or damage, any of which will render your software or machine completely unusable. It's a very scary prospect. Um, so we are starting to run out of time here. Oh. I don't know if you can wrap up. Um, sure. But um, yeah, we're going to have to wrap okay. up. Okay, yeah. I'll hit on just a couple more real quick. Great, thank you. Okay, password books. Don't use them. Because if you lose your password book, if someone picks up and takes it from you, uh, all your passwords are gone. I've seen these a lot. In fact, this is one that's sold on Amazon. Don't do this. Don't stick your password under your keyboard. Everybody knows that's where people put their passwords. Don't put it on a post-it and, and stick it to your computer monitor and then do a live stream where everyone can see your password like I've seen people do before, which is a really dumb idea. Don't use password books. You can use LastPass, one password, or another secure encrypted password storage solution. Uh, firewalls. Again, if you bought if you bought your modem from a, anywhere except Sparklight, you might not have a firewall. One can be set up, or you can get a different modem. Uh, firewalls keep all the bad stuff out and can keep all the good stuff in. All right, done. <laughs> good job. Thank you. Um, that was super informative, and I really appreciate your uh, advice here. And I've written some stuff down. I'm sure everybody else has too. So uh, we want to thank you very much. And if anybody is interested in getting our no-cost business consultations, please sign up at yc.edu slash SBDC. And Chris can be found at lumocomputers.com. And thank you again, Chris. We appreciate it. Bye Thank now. You.